Good morning, viewers. Welcome to Frankly Speaking with Vibhuti Jha. We are looking at the world from a very challenging situation that is emerging in the world's two largest and most powerful democracies, India and United States of America. India is our home country. United States is our country of residence and current we are citizens of living here, earning here, making our life here. So the events that happen here impact us just as events back home impact us. So let's begin with one very, very important topic is the impeachment of the President of the United States. We have had two hearings so far uh, in the open public hearing to establish whether Mr. Trump persuaded the Ukrainian government to make an investigation into Biden matter, whether this investigation is corruption related or whether this investigation is about influencing the foreign country to determine the course of action or election thing that is going to happen here, particularly when Mr. Biden, the former vice president, is a candidate himself. We will also talk about events back home in the sense that the way the, the Shiv Shena has behaved with BJP and the entire thing is a remarkable event to happen when after election the ally sabotages the senior partner and is asking for its proverbial pound of flesh. How justified is that claim? And its attempt to have a partnership with INC and NCP, led by Mrs. Gandhi and Mr. Sharad Pawar, the two parties who hate Siv Shena through the grist of their blood, if I may use a strong language. However, they are trying to make an alliance on a base on a common minimum program. Politics does indeed bring about strange bedfellows. We will talk about that. We will definitely touch upon Kashmir issue because it's not going to end because the liberal media is taking it in a very, very different way. They are categorizing entire Kashmir, Ayodhya Ram Mandir as a human rights, religious suppression issue. How justified is that? To discuss all this today, I have great pleasure in welcoming my very dear friend Rajiv Khanna. Hi Rajiv. Hi, how Welcome are you? Welcome to the show. Rajiv is an attorney as most of us know and he is a corporate lawyer and you know it is important to get a legal perspective because all these issues have significant legal impact and implication and I mean we need not have expertise on everything but there is a lawyer's perspective is required because we are countries which believe in rule of law. So Rajiv let's talk about President Trump's impeachment proceedings that has been initiated by the Democratic Party. If you look at it from the point of view of Republican and Mr. Trump it seems to be their point of view is that this is an investigation on corruption part of it, which is rather bizarre because, you know, Hunter Biden got a job which pays him 50 to $70,000 a month for his expertise in energy and whatever, which in normal parlance we will wonder, really? Is that true? On the other hand, it seems there was an element of quid pro quo, although the evidence of quid pro quo doesn't seem to be there. Rajiv, your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a political circus in uh, light of the coming election. So I don't think the Democrats hope to remove this president because they clearly don't have the numbers to do that. They can impeach him, but then the Senate has to remove him, and that requires a two-thirds majority in the Senate. And they don't even have a simple majority. So they are doing this to tarnish him ahead of the election. And they're doing a good job. They're also doing it to deflect attention from what Hunter Biden may or may sh should or should not have done, did do or did not do. I mean, getting a lucrative job on boards. Um, uh, I'll leave it to your imagination to say whether that's corruption or that's not corruption. 
whether asking a president of another country to investigate corruption is right or wrong, or whether there was a quid pro quo, but suddenly they've done a very good job of turning their scales on uh, Trump. Because now everybody's talking about whether there was quid pro quo and is forgetting about the underlying allegation of corruption against Hunter Biden. So uh, this will go on, nothing will happen, nothing can happen. Even if they impeach him, they cannot remove him. They know that. So they are wasting the country's resources in a political campaign. They should campaign. They, as, a, as a party, they should campaign on their program and not a negative campaign, and certainly not a negative campaign at taxpayers' expense, which is all this is, a negative campaign at taxpayers' expense. They are paid to do their work. They are doing work that enhances the chances of victory in the next election. That is not what the taxpayers pay them to do. That is what they should do on the site. They should raise their funds. They can have a PAC. They can take out uh, commercials. But to waste taxpayers' money on their political campaign is in some ways corruption, political corruption in itself, as far as I can see. <laughs> that's, that's a very fascinating point you brought in, Rajiv, that this appears to be a political corruption in its own way. And in its own way. I, I, watched, I watched both the debates, uh, and, uh, both the uh, hearings, actually. I watched both the hearings, and you know, in democracy, rule of law, you give the accused a chance to present his point of view. And it is almost shocking yeah. for us to see that how Adam Schiff is not giving any opportunity to the Republican Party for the rules that he has framed to give them a chance to prove that it is not so. And they are not even allowing a, a, you know, the Republican congressman to question the witnesses. That is remarkably you know, proving a fact. In two days, at least, I did not see any evidence emerge. On the contrary, it was bizarre that in this country, how we are running down the rule of law, that one of the Democratic congressmen said, hey, it's, we don't need the evidence. Even circumstantial proof is enough to indict somebody. And as you rightly mentioned, and I applaud you for that, is that this is, what is the end game? You are not going to have this Senate confirm this particular proceeding of the uh, Democratic Party's congressional uh, House uh, uh, you know, investigation, it's not going to happen. You are not going to get more than two-thirds to vote and 19 Republicans are not going to turn around, turn on Trump for this kind of a verification. This is truly sad and this is, in my opinion, it's creating democracy itself becomes on trial. Is this what we want our representatives to do? And if you look at it this way, that ever since the Democrats have come to House, leadership, they haven't done anything. Everything has been about impeach. And what disturbed me was that when we, when we, when we see certain news that emerges, that there was a guy, Washington Post wrote 19 minutes into swearing in that let impeachment process begin, right? Washington Post wrote that article. And there was a guy, Zayed, who wrote that now we will not let him go through the 2017. Let the impeachment begin. That puts me to another question. Does it undermine people's faith in its leadership and the rule of law itself? Is that if the politicians who live in their own half-baked world of their own half-truths, and it applies to everybody, how does it hurt the legal process that people lose faith? Is that, is this what our people are doing? I think the people will lose faith in the uh, elected representatives. If the, if the Congress wanted to be objective, they should have investigated both allegations. They should have investigated the allegation against Hunter Biden. They should have investigated the allegation against Trump. Let both investigations happen. But to investigate one, to say that the president was wrong in putting pressure on somebody to investigate an alleged crime, but not to investigate the underlying alleged crime, is an insult to the intelligence of the people. And people will see it that way. 
I think ultimately the impeachment of Bill Clinton, which you mentioned, did not help the Republicans. And I'm very glad it did not because that was a political circus in itself. And the impeachment of President Trump is not going to help, help the Democrats. People want the elected representatives to do a job. That's why they pay them. That's why they elect them. That's why they give them a campaign contribution. Not to go and try to win the next election by slandering the opponent. That's, that's not what America is about. America is about building. America is not about pulling down the other guy, who by hook or by crook. And I think Nancy Pelosi has really got it all wrong if she thinks that this would actually help the re-election re of the Democrats come next year. It won't. It'll, it's only going to hurt her. And it, you, are, you are totally right. I, I like the way you put it, the saying that the underlying cause for everything. Right. So the underlying cause for this one is, it's not that Trump woke up and called the president, okay, investigate Biden. But there was an underlying cause of corruption. Uh -huh. And if you remember one thing, in all fairness to Or allegation of corruption. Alle allegation of corruption. In all fairness to Mr. Trump, he puts him, he is his own worst enemy, in my opinion. He must, I tweet, actually I tweeted him and said to him that there is an ancient word called silence is golden. Please he apply that. Matter. Please apply that, at least in case of impeachment inquiry. Don't incriminate yourself by making statements which are not necessary. If you want to tweet, tweet about everything else except impeachment inquiry. He mm -hmm. must be careful on that account, but economy is doing great. Black employment, Latino employment, it's wonderful. It has gone up you know, significantly. So generally, the economic, when the people say that it's all about the economy is stupid, the economy is doing great. I mean, he's fixing problems that were supposedly intractable. He's addressing those problems. That said, it brings us to another democracy, India. And in the, in the Indian context, you have seen in Maharashtra a crazy situation develop. And the crazy situation is that the alliance partner, Shiv Shana, which has won about 50 odd seats against BJP's 105 with a strike rate of 70%, has chosen to ditch its own ally where Mr. Modi is riding the goodwill train all over the world. And I do not know who is advising Udhav Thakare that he is now trying to team up with Congress and Pawar, Pawar's party, which he has, both the parties hate Shiv Sena and Thakare's, and Thakare's hate them. Politics does make strange bedfellows. Now, BJP has said, Shiv Sainiks are very unhappy about this particular alliance. And BJP has said that we will get 120 or 100 seats. How do you see this emerging in the Indian context? The center is strong, but BJP loses, has lost so far. Congress Mukta Bharat to chhod dije, where you, you have a scenario Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and now Maharashtra. It has become a danger spot that BJP may not even form the government, which affects their Rajya Sabha scenario. Your thoughts on that? I think, um, unfortunately, the dynastic rule is playing again. Now, I don't know Mr. Thakre's qualifications to be chief minister, but if his primary credential is that his, is his last name, then he's the last person who deserves to be chief minister. And nobody's told me other things about his credentials. Maybe he has great credentials, but the credential that is being talked about is his last name, which should be the last credential in a democracy we should talk about. Otherwise, why did we choose to be a republic? We, could, we had kings, we had princes, we could have left it just that way. And if we've chosen to be a democracy, we should stop looking at the person's last name to be a head of state or a head of, uh, head of the country. So that, that's my first comment on that. And uh, my second comment is that whatever is the Shiv Sena's agenda, whatever is their manifesto, it certainly is nowhere, nowhere close to that of the Congress or NCP for them to team up 
with parties who are ideologically so different from them is not right. It's not morally right. Whether if they don't want to be with BJP, that's their prerogative. They can sit in the opposition. If they if they can make a if BJP can make a government or ask for a re-election. But you cannot just team up with anybody just because you want to be the chief minister. That is so wrong on so many fronts that it's not funny. And it's again, uh, I don't like president's rule because president's rule basically means you don't have a state level democracy. A state level democracy is important because democracy at the, the leaders at the state level understand the state problems much better than a governor appointed uh, by the president, uh, essentially by the ruling party. So you need state level democracy and you need leaders or parties to act sensibly and rationally to stick to their electoral alliance, to stick to their uh, core beliefs, whether they're right or wrong. I would dispute many of Shiv Sena's core beliefs, but they should have the courage to stick to their core beliefs and not prostitute themselves into power. This is really just prostituting yourself into power. And if you prostitute yourself into power, then people will see you as what you are, a prostitute. So that, and that may be the end of Shiv Sena if they actually succeed. And they may actually be better off if they fail. Yeah, it is especially true because as the alliance they got substantial number of seats to form the government. Right. People of Maharashtra voted them in this alliance of BJP and Shiv Sena. For Shiv Sena to f move the track and go somewhere else, for all the good reasons that you have mentioned, apart from the dynastic thing, how different is Shiv Sena behaving than Congress Party's family limited partnership? Shiv Sena is nothing else but a family limited partnership. Right. And I call them Thakre Sena, not Shiv Sena, because they neither represent Shiva nor they represent Shivaji. Stay tuned, we will be back right after this short break. Welcome back. We are going to talk about one very important issue and that is the Kashmir, Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh issue. Somebody had challenged, Farooq Abdullah himself had challenged that Modi will not be able to disentangle the Article 370 issue in 100 years. But the shrewd man and the determined personal Prime Minister Modi is, he did show the path how the challenge can be disentangled. Consequently, today you have a completely new map of the entire region. The state has been reorganized like any other st Indian state has been reorganized. Bihar, Jharkhand, you have had uh, you know, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, you have had Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh, you have had Punjab. Himachal Pradesh and Haryana. So these are the reorganization uh, Telangana and Hyderabad, uh, Telangana and Andhra. So their state reorganization has been a prerogative of the center and they did it. So they created a situation which now addresses the real fundamental issues in, in Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. Three very distinct cultural and sp spiritual regions which were not necessarily all Islamic. So the question is, how does the world perceive? In the United States, it is a fashion to have a congressional hearing. So, you know, the opponents of India have been and Kashmir, anti-Kashmir lobbies have been making it as a human rights issue. So much so that even Indian congressmen, people who are, you know, Indians in this country who are congressmen, they are terming it as a human rights violation. It is not. Kashmir, that whole region, has, is the integral part of India for 5,000 years, including Pakistan, which was given a political status after the British left in 1947. Kashmir was allowed to fester as a wound, and Indian government failed to nip the wound in the bud in the early stages. So now it has become a human rights violation. It's not a human rights violation, in my opinion. It is a cultural integration of Kashmiris with the entire country no more separate laws. So Rajiv, is this a human rights issue? Uh, uh, you know, abrogating the articles or suspending the you know, communication channels for a while? 
it's all open now. You know, the, the biggest uh, proponent of democracy was Abe Lincoln. Right. Or one of the biggest ones, right? right? And he was the first one to do something like this Correct. when there was war. So when there's a situation of war, which essentially this is what it is, uh, the terrorists have declared war on Kashmir. So it is okay temporarily to suspend certain uh, rights. But the real, uh, well, it's again like the Hunter Biden situation. You're not looking at the underlying crime. The underlying crime against the Kashmiri people are, as you and I know, an average Kashmiri is not a terrorist. So to say that 100% of the Kashmiris are terrorists would be, is absurd. Maybe and five, nobody's saying that either. Well, right. Maybe five, maybe 10, mm -hmm. max, I would say, okay, if you want to stretch it, 20% are terrorists. Those 20% have for the last whatever years hijacked the rights of the majority to prosper, to do business. To Kashmir is a natural place for tourism, but tourists will not go. And tourists don't go, every Kashmiri suffers. They have hijacked the prosperity of the Kashmiris. They have hijacked the livelihood of the Kashmiris. They have hijacked the rug makers from Kashmir are sitting at the outskirts of Delhi. Why? They would like to go home. They would like to do what they do at home. So this hijacking of the rights of the majority is a crime that terrorists have perpetrated with the help of Pakistan. And it is time that somebody put an end to this crime. And hats off to Prime Minister Modi for doing that. I, you know, actually looking at the situation, I only say one thing. So how come nobody else did it before him? If it was that simple, it should have been done long back. Average Kashmiris should have the right to prosper in their own country, in their own state, by doing tourism, by doing, making carpets, and doing other things that they're very good at. And they have been completely deprived for 40, 50 years because terrorists have taken over the state. So it's time somebody got those terrorists under control. And hats off to Prime Minister Modi for coming up with a plan to do that. And you're right. The only thing that binds Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh is the fact that they had a common king who was a Hindu king. Jammu is diametrically opposite from Kashmir. Its requirements are different. Its growth plans are different. Its population is different. Ladakh is a completely separate story. So to mix the three up would be like to mix what we had earlier, to mix Punjab, Haryana, and Himachal into one thing. And they are, they, as we have seen, regions prosper when they're broken up into small part, smaller parts where their particular local problems are dealt at a local level by people who understand the local needs. And I think, I think that's where they're headed. They should split it into three states. They each should have its own chief minister and they can deal with it. But obviously we got to get this warlike situation which the terrorists have created under control before uh, that can be allowed to happen. So the real violation of human rights is the violation of the human right of every Kashmiri to prosper in a country that God gave them and that has so much of natural beauty that God gave them the right to use it for their livelihood. I, I think that's a real uh, human rights violation. How can you say that killing terrorists or controlling terrorists is a violation of any human rights. They don't have human rights. They are huh? breaking human rights. And is it, this is, there is another they are the point. Criminals. Yeah, they are the criminals, they, yes. They, you are so worried about the five or ten percent of the uh, human rights of the five or ten percent of the criminal population of the state that you're forgetting about the uh, human rights of the 90, 100% or 90, 80, whatever percent of the uh, majority of the state. And that brings to another point, which is very important. And that important point is also that when the Western media talks about the human rights violation, they were all silent when 300,000 or more 
Hindus from Kashmir were thrown out, raped, humiliated, and threatened to murder. And they, they lived like refugees in their own country. At that time, the human rights issue was no, not an issue. And that's where the important thing comes out, that we Indians must know how to make agenda in the manner that the West understands. So right now, it's a human rights violation. It's a fanciful statement, human rights violation. But the question is, but when you violate somebody's core right and you don't talk about that, then it sounds phony. And that's what disturbs. That's what I say, the fabric of democracy is under threat. Because you take the points which suits your convenience or the vote bank politics. And that's what is dangerous for this entire thing. Mr. Modi accomplished another great thing which was supposedly intractable. The Supreme Court ruled for Ram Mandir in Ayodhya. That itself is a really a galvanizing event because for last as many years, this, for as many years, Ayodhya had become a bane for Hindus, a curse for Hindus. And we were suffering that in our own country, where we observe Ram Jayanti, we observe Ram Naomi holidays. Supreme Court takes holiday on Ram Naomi Jayanti, and they were talking about they also the take it on Eid. Though. I'm sorry. They also take it on Eid. They they take it on Eid. I'm just saying that it, the the person, or in wonder whose name you take a vacation, you are trying to establish whether he was real or not. Now that's the important part. The Supreme Court gave rather interesting judgments in this favor. But I wonder why did they give five acres of land to. The, the, for Babri Masjid when they didn't ask for it. And it was not Supreme Court's uh, subjective decision to give five. Why five? Any idea on that? Why not one? Why not 2.7 exact? Well, I guess it's figured, uh, figured that five was a uh, fair amount of land. Five but judges, one acre each? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but the point is that, uh, look, India is a country which is prides itself in the rule of law. A rule of law has a system of courts, and there's a court on top. And there are ultimately human beings sitting there and making a decision. But the rule of law requires that then the final decision is made by a court, whether it's the US Supreme Court or the Indian Supreme Court, it is respected. So I will go even as far as to say that if the Supreme Court of India made a wrong decision, it is still a binding decision, subject to no further appeal, and people should move on, and people should respect it. Um, now, whether they are competent to dis decide whether Ram existed or not existed, whether they're not competent is not relevant. It is their decision. It is the, this is the process that we signed on to when we signed on to giving power to the judiciary as an equal branch of the government. And so they have exercised their power. And to your point, uh, whether they should have given one, two, three, four, five acres or 10 acres or 15 acres is not relevant. It is their decision and it should be honored. Yeah, it, it will be honored. There is no, I'm, I'm only yeah, but, looking but at it from this point of view. there should not be so much discussion view. about no, it too. I the mean, question does come up as to, you know, you gave, you showed a gesture. Right. And I'm nothing, nothing against the gesture. I'm only talking about why five acres. It is each judge gave one acre each or, you know, it, why not 2.7, why not one, why not 10? That's what I'm saying. So I mean, you had to come up with five. some number for five. <laughs> I think they thought was a good um, amount of land to uh, build a mosque and, uh, you know, uh, it is what it is, and I, I do believe it's good for the country to uh, let this issue settle because it's been, it's been there yeah. since Advani's time, right? Yeah, when yeah. Advani first raised okay. it. I mean, it has been there for many, many years. But, uh, before but it became, that, became 1992, it became an all-out war. Yeah, yeah, 1992 right. is 2018. It's time that the country settled that issue, and, and there's a resolution on it, and both Hindus and Muslims can move on uh, from that decision. Yeah. Uh, so I, th that's how I feel. I mean, look, it's very hard to have an evidence of what happened hundreds of years ago. The, of course, this, uh, like I, as a Hindu, I like to believe that the Hindus were wrong. But if I look at it objectively, whatever happened, there was a court of law that made a decision, and we should all live with it. 
and feel that it's time to move on from there. That's right. I mean, that's, that's, that's a very important one because Maryada Purushottam Ram was a symbol of Hindus, the last so, called, so, God, so much called God, as a, as a human who did extraordinary things. So the question here is again, that Muslims have been destroying many, many temples in the past and Islamic architecture does exist over that. Do you feel sometimes that a faith that is based on Sharia is respectful of saying that, yes, we did a wrong thing by destroying your temples, take it back. Can we ever accept a gesture of the kind? Because if I were, uh, let me put it this way to you. I'm not being facetious, but I'm saying this in all seriousness. This was a moment, particularly Ram Temple, where Muslims could have earned enormous respect or camaraderie or brotherhood with Hindus if they had said, yes, I mean, Babri is a Babur king made that mosque I over the temple, take it. The question here is they didn't. They fought the democratic process where one of the Uzbek kings came and destroyed that. That's a very sentimental issue, which I'm very proud of Prime Minister Modi to have resolved with a continuous hearing and put the matter to bed forever. These are remarkable achievements of Prime Minister Modi. The other thing which happened recently, which just happened two days ago. But I'm glad that he did it yeah. the way, the process is just as important as what he did. He did not do it by an executive Correct. order. Correct. He let the courts decide it. A and he is living with the decision. That is the right way to do it. Whether Muslims should have made a gesture, whether Hindus should have made a gesture, it, frankly, I think both exercise their right to plead their case in the court, and the court decided. I do not go, I would not go as far as to say that the Muslims should have made a gesture. Their religion teaches them that what Baba did was right, and they're entitled to the belief. But we have a, we have a that's why there's depth in Indian democracy. We have a process. Both sides were heard and a decision was and made. And that is where the word reciprocity plays a very important role. In democracy, in communities, in countries that we live, we reciprocate to each other. Your goodwill gesture gets reciprocated. If you do not reciprocate, then people draw a hard line. And that's what is the point which I was trying to drive at. I'm not asking them, show me goodwill. No, I'm not asking. I'm not begging of goodwill. I'm saying, show me a gesture, uh, you, know, uh, you know, kind of a consideration as the saying goes. Okay, you beat me in the war and you destroyed my temple and built your own, fine. That matter is over. Can we come to a conclusion in this way? But no, we went to the court and I'm glad. But here is an important well, part. As a, as here, here here is an important I'm glad part. people go to court. Yeah, so we would here have is an important that. part, the Western narrative. And that's what angered me, that when BBC and New York Times talked about uh, a court has ruled towards Hindus by demolishing a mosque. This is where you get angry about democracy being on trial. And that's where the role of NRIs becomes important. We live here. We deal with New York Times, Washington Post, Washington Times, and Time Magazine, and what have you, and BBCs of the world. What can we do? Is there any role for us NRIs in this entire process? Or are we not required Indians? Or are we the new no. responsible Indians? We should let the media know what our views are. And our views may not be the same because there are Hindu NRIs and the Muslim NRIs. And they may not view a situation like that in the same way. And each is entitled to their view. Each is entitled to their religion. But I think the more important thing is to emphasize that there's a rule of law. There's a process. And nobody said. Supreme Court makes the best, right decision every time, but that is the process. A and there is a finality to, and the process must have finality, and uh, or no legal process can survive. So therefore, there was a process. The Hindus spread the case, the Muslims spread the case, and I think it's, it speaks volumes of India that this was actually not resolved in the streets. This was actually resolved in the courtroom. In many countries, this would be resolved in the streets. And this was the right way for it to get, to get resolved. And credit goes to Prime Minister Modi that he also respected the process. Yes. He did not do it by an executive right, order. Right. He could have. 
Yes. Right? He can, yeah, yeah. Actually, if he, he, was, if he, he can, be, if he can take away Article 370 by executive order, he can do this right, too. Right. right? He could have that. Right? But if, even even in, Kash in, in in Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh, as well as in Ram Mandir scenario, Prime Minister Pr Modi let the process play out. Right. The process has to play out. The process has played out, and that's the victory. What 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 is interesting is that under the right of individual right of expression. When people begin to spread canard and they hide the issue. So, for example, recently there was another article in Washington Post in which they talked about that the Hindus' courts, you know, they permitted the destruction of mosque in Ayodhya. They did not say that the mosque itself was built by destroying a temple. That is where we need to point out to Washington Post and they, we have to be alert. That's the, all that I have to say. Of course, we can't move. We are only 3 million Indians here. Our votes count only to the limited extent. But when it comes to the power of the pen, the social media, it's, we should reach out. We must not should. We must reach out to the Washington Post and correct the fact. You know, that's very important to do that. Stay tuned. In the next segment, we are going to talk about a very important economic issue in India. And we will spend a lot of time for that. Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about one of the most important issues in the Indian economy and that is the banking sector. The issue of non-performing assets in India has become a joke which has assumed such seriousness that it never had achieved before. My interaction or my coming to know of non-performing assets happened in 1979. The first time, although this particular phrase was not used, but I was a trainee officer in Reserve Bank of India in a social evening get together at somebody's house in Bangalore. I was approached by a reporter of one of the local newspapers who said, can you give me the Canara Bank report that RBI inspection has done? I was aghast. I was aghast. I said that, look, I'm a trainee officer. And you can't even dare to ask me that question. Apart from that, I will never give you. Go to the bank and ask for the information. And I, then I asked him, why exactly are you interested in this report? And he said that there are so many loans that have been given by Canara Bank to institutions or industry in Karnataka. They are never going to get their money back. They are only showing interest accrued, but even the interest is not being paid and the loans are not going to come. That was quite interesting. Fast forward, we are in 2019. I personally encountered the situation of non-performing asset as a banker when I worked with American Express in corporate banking and private banking. Because lending, the banks don't lend their own money. They lend other people's money which is with them as a deposit. So preserving the quality of assets is key. Who you give, who you don't and that you has to be monitored properly because you do not want to give money to somebody just because he came to ask so today the NPA in India has reached gigantic horrible proportions the average is supposed to be more than 10 percent three three large banks have NPAs of over 20 percent how can the sector survive because it affects the economy the lending everything else Rajiv has first-hand information about this and I have from the legal perspective and I have the first-hand information as a banker because I dealt with this situation. So let's talk about this. The Prime Minister is taking in trying to clean up the corruption part of it. The Prime Minister is also hitting on the banking sector big time which has reduced the flow of capital to the industries and they are saying nothing is happening in India now. How do you interpret the whole scenario? Well, I mean, on the positive side, what the Prime Minister is doing to force the banks to l come to reality and clean up the balance sheet is healthy. At the same time, I do feel that more should be done to deal with the underlying cause of the NPS. The underlying cause of the NPS is the nationalized banks or the government majority owned banks. The worst thing that Indira Gandhi did to India was to nationalize the banks. 
the bank officers, there are two underlying causes of NPAs in India. One is political pressure on bank officers, and two is corruption. And Prime Minister Modi can, to some extent, limit both of them. But they're like a cancer. He's going to be there, what, another five years, 10 years, 15 years maximum? And then what? This is like a cancer. It keeps coming back. So unless you remove the underlying cause of why the banks have such huge NPAs, you're not going to solve the problem. You need to privatize them. You need the, to make them accountable to, to the shareholders, not to a shareholder that is run by politicians, but a real shareholders uh, of, of the bank. And they're not there. And if you can't sell them, s give the stock of the uh, bank to the employees. Let them be the shareholders. If you're too scared to privatize, do an ESOP structure where Somebody other than the government holds the shares of the bank. Because the worst thing is that is there is that the government holds the shares of the bank. As long as the government holds shares of the bank, there will be corruption and there will be political pressure to lend and to lend to the wrong people. And then the Great Reserve Bank of India has ECB guidelines where it says you cannot get external commercial borrowing except at LIBOR plus whatever. Now, and there's no distinction. The same rule applies to the Tata's. The same rule applies to the struggling uh, uh, company. I mean, you have, you've been a banker. How ridiculous is it yeah. that the, uh, Babu in the State Reserve Bank of India is mandating an interest rate to be applied equally for the AAA credit and by, uh, to uh, B minus minus credit? It doesn't work. You have to let capital flow into the country. You, then there are restrictions on equity capital flowing into the country. Why don't you let capital flow into the country, both as equity and debt freely, and let the businessman decide whether he wants to borrow from an Indian bank or he wants to borrow from an overseas market? Let them be the judge. If the Babus in the Reserve Bank of India are so smart, why are they Babus? Why aren't they running their own businesses unless they are sitting there for corruption? So uh, the whole system is rotten to its core. And while I'm glad that we're taking part of, care of this part, we're not taking care of the underlying uh, part. And this cleanup is only going to be temporary. And it's going to bring, bring only temporary results. But then it's, since the core is rotten, the cancer will, uh, will come back. And also, the bankruptcy reform makes no distinction between a borrower who has had a genuine commercial failure and a borrower who has stolen. It treats every borrower as a thief. So I'll take an example. So let's say there are two guys who are developing a power project. There is one who steals half the money that he gets from the banks and his power plant fails. The other one builds a power plant 80% of the way through. The state government yanks away the PPA, the power purchase agreement. Now his economics is completely turned and he has a choice to finish the project or to lose the 80%. So he finishes the project and tries to make it work. Why will you treat both defaulters equally? Why would you not give the second one a chance to restructure. But you don't. You have defaulted, you have six months, and then you are out. What are you doing? What, are you, what is the message you are sending to the business community that don't take risk? Because if you take risk and you fail, we will liquidate you. Is that the entrepreneurship that the country needs to build forward? to treat every businessman as a criminal, as a crook. Granted, there are a lot of them who are, but you still have to have room for genuine commercial failures where you treat the person differently than the one who has stolen the money. And the ba bankruptcy 
code in India makes absolutely no distinction. And that's really sad. And, and, and yeah, it is going to hurt that country in the long run because businessmen are not going to take risk. Growth will not happen. They cannot be business without risk. And they cannot be business, uh, business without gutsy businessmen. Those who have genuinely commercially failed should be given a chance to reorganize in every different way. And those who have stolen should be put in jail. It's as simple as that. And that's the important part here. You know, like we talked about the private sector, public sector banks. Believe it or not, IDBI, um, United Commercial Bank, and Indian Overseas Bank have NPAs over 20%. Think about it. Private sector banks, NPAs are 2%. And you that's what it. I have always been saying, and we talked about that. Exactly. But there, are a, there are situations in which businesses will run into trouble. Businesses will run into trouble because there are external factors or internal ma issues that can affect the business adversely. So unless and until you have an institutional framework that treats each one of the success and failures in a different way, you can't have one jacket fits all or one punishment for everybody. And mind you, in Indian context, more than 50% of NPAs were government-induced NPAs. Right. Because the government, you know, as you mentioned about Babus of RBI, I was an RBI employee myself. I was an officer in RBI when I probationer. I left, but RBI officers have regulatory authority. And regulatory authority, when you make regulations only to prevent something from happening, then innovation doesn't happen, entrepreneurship doesn't happen, risk taking goes down. And why take risk? And that's why we as a country became risk averse country, because you get punished for taking risk. Because in psychological profile, if you look at, in this country, if you have, they admire the comeback kid. In India, if you failed once, you are condemned forever. And that mindset must change. So the Indian banking sector has to go through two kinds of structural shifts, not only legal, but it has to operate on the other side that the government need not know anything about, uh, need not get involved in every aspect of business dealing. Because not everybody is thief. I haven't come across any businessman wanting to deliberately fail. Everybody wants to succeed. That's, I believe that everybody wants to succeed. Nobody wants to fail. So one last bit here before we run out of time again, as it always happens, that, you know, uh, the, the restructuring part is something which I really love because if somebody has run into genuine trouble, he must get a chance to reorganize because businesses fail because your marketing went awry, your financial management, you missed the bus, you didn't handle your products better or you didn't handle your people better. Or the government policy changed. Or the changed. government policy changed. So if these are the factors, these are internal factors as I call them, and then that one must get a chance to reboot itself. Your thoughts? We have just exactly two minutes. No, I, I think unless, unless the bankruptcy code as is currently written in India is completely gutted and it's written on the British principle of liquidation. You went wrong, let's liquidate you. Uh, it has to be on the American principle of giving a failed business an opportunity to re reform itself, to restructure itself, and if it doesn't, then yes, it eventually gets liquidated. And yes, if, this, uh, if there is malfeasance by the business, then they don't get a chance to restructure. I, I think they really picked the wrong code as, as a model in India, and while everybody is applauding what, what uh, uh, it the long-term consequences in India are going to be severe of the bankruptcy structure that they bought. That's my view. I'm, I, I totally agree with you because the British structure is not suitable for Indian structure. I was told, I mean, you know, there are certain times you get a chance to share your personal experience. Once upon a time in India, a major institution asked me, can you bring the best practices in this particular area for, to make our policy? And I was very blunt about it and I said, which best practice do you want? Bank of Mongolia or San Francisco B Reserve Bank policy or Bank of China or Bank of England? So this is the flaw that Indian bureaucratic mindset works with. Wherever there is a best practice, let's get it. I am myself uh, suspicious of the best practices. 
what works for me may not work for you. So how can I say that my best practice is relevant for you? Maybe certain parts of my best practice is relevant for you. And I implored upon the chairman and the, the group of the people that develop the Indian ethos, develop the Indian practice that will establish your own cultural element. Because India is 1.2 billion people. The businesses are far flung. People are, call it jugar, call it entrepreneurial, any which way. People know how to get things done and they operate under a severe structure of rules and regulations which are made by bureaucracy and they will not relent on banking because that's where the money lies. And there are so many things that we can't talk openly. But the issue here is again that unless and until you provide that only the willful defaulters will be punished and unless and until you teach the bankers that you are giving money which is not yours but public money, somebody's deposit you are doing as lending, there is a cost of capital of deposits. For years, Indian banking sector operated deposit mobilization is the only thing to do. But they forgot there is a cost of capital. There are so many issues that need to be highlighted in the Indian banking say They need a structural shift. And there are some structural shifts have happened. They merged three banks. Now again, I'm totally against that kind of a merger. They decided that three banks will, some picked up three banks and they say merge. Nobody will be laid off. But that's an unrealistic effort to do because mergers and acquisition as we know it is a painful process. It's a profitable process. But 70% of the mergers fail in America too. And well, it's a cosmetic goes, process. You, yeah. you merge a weak bank with a strong bank, so then you make them both a little, you make the weaker bank a little stronger, but the stronger bank you make weak. So it's a cosmetic, it's, it's a cosmetic process. Right. It is not solving the underlying ma malice in the, uh, in the bank itself. Right. And the underlying is that the shareholding structure is all messed up. There is no accountability to anybody. Right. And I will appeal to the Indian banking sector, the people are bright, people are smart, but they get entangled in the government bureaucracy and the rules. So I worked with public sector, I worked with private sector, American Express. The speed of delivery of a product or service was so much superior in our setup in American Express, for that matter, that if something was required, we delivered in three and four days. Same same delivery by a public sector bank would take six months, multiple board meetings, unless and until you revamp the structure of decision making to deliver goods and services to your clients. Not all businessmen are thieves. There are willful defaulters. Let them be punished. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers, thank you very much for staying put. As I always say, every good conversation has to conclude at some point in time. We have ended today's a portion quota of time. Rajiv, thank you very much thank for being with us. Thank you for having us. me. And thank you. It was a pleasure having you. And have a great weekend and talk to you soon next week. Thank you.